Hi everyone and welcome to our Tech Talk introduction to NG Firewall. I'm Sherilyn Hill. I'm part of the team over here at Untangle. Uh, leading our webinar today is Graham Ravenscroft, technical marketing engineer. Um, and he'll get into everything NG Firewall, including the demo in just a second, but it's the usual housekeeping items. Um, and first, just want to say, um, hi, Patrick in Chicago. Thanks for letting us know. That's cool. Um, okay, housekeeping. To get the best view, um, choose the highest screen resolution via the gear icon there. Um, the slide shows where you can find that in the bottom right of the viewer. Um, if you have that, um, we highly recommend it. Second, if you have any questions, um, please include those in the chat box. Um, we try to answer them during the webinar. Um, if for some reason we can't, then we will follow up with you um, afterwards. And lastly, if you need to leave the webinar for any reason, um, please remember that all the webinars are available on, dem on demand and you can also find them on YouTube so you can watch any time that you would like. Now, over to Graham. Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good evening, good night, etc. Um, before I jump in, there actually is a question already, and it sort of leads into some things that I want to cover here. So uh, someone has has mentioned an issue with reports being broken. Um, I'm going to recommend you contact our support team. So you can email them at support at untangle.com, um, or you can find them at uh, support .untangle.com. Uh, we'll get you to our knowledge base and have some contact information there. Um, there, there are any number of things that could be going on, and honestly, um, someone's going to need to take a look at it. It's essentially where I was going with that. Uh, so that's a good point for everyone who is uh, is attending this webinar to be aware of. Um, you can contact our support team. They're available Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Time, or 5 a.m. to 5 p.m. Pacific. Um, they can be reached by phone, by email at support.untangle.com, or excuse me, support at untangle.com, or our knowledge base, uh, which is a really great sort of self-help uh, resource, is going to be at support.untangle.com. And so... Um, just really quickly, there are a couple of technical issues that came in. It looks that way, yeah. Um, unfortunately, it, if you're not seeing the video, it's a bright talk issue. Um, I did double check and the video is running. Um, so I don't know what that is. And with there, I don't believe there is a phone number to call in for the audio. Let me double check on that. Um, unfortunately, I don't see a number for calling in for the audio on that. Um, so I apologize for that. Um, if it doesn't work today, then hopefully you can uh, watch that on demand. All right, Graham, back to you. All right. So the first thing that I wanted to address to cover is going to be just some kind of high-level information about what NG Firewall is. And uh, this slide kind of covers it. We are an advanced security platform, a UTM or a... A unified threat management appliance, <clears throat> providing protection, encryption, control, and visibility into your traffic and your network from anywhere. We provide content filtering, intrusion prevention. Uh, there's some virus blocking, spam blocking, you name it, we do it. We provide simplified security for small network appliances and for IoT devices. Um, a lot of times, these kinds of devices need specialized configuration. You know, you need your camera system to be accessible from the internet, or you need to be able to print from outside subnets, uh, from foreign subnets, so on and so forth. And we try to take a lot of the sting out of that configuration as best we can. And we do have flexible deployment options, either on-premise in a hardware appliance, yours or ours, or in cloud-based uh, deployments in Amazon uh, Web Services or Azure. And as you can see, we won a fun little award as a gold medalist and category leader for a next generation firewall project product. So that's pretty fun. And then some details, slightly more technical details uh, about the NG firewall. NG firewall operates broadly speaking in two portions. There is the layer three portion, which is gonna be that first, that first category platform, the software platform for your network routing, your security, all kind of your basic layer three uh, routing functions and features. 
And then the layer seven untangled virtual machine or UVM, which is where the apps and the GUI live. And that's where all the traffic inspection, uh, filtering protection, et cetera, is going to operate. And we also have uh, extremely full featured, very detailed granular reporting. Uh, there are about 400 default reports that come along with the untangle that provide tons and tons and tons of information about all of the traffic passing through your network. As for our deployment options, as I said, you can apply, you can deploy to an appliance, uh, a physical hardware platform, and that can be either the appliance that you purchase from us, or that can be your own hardware. You can install in a virtual environment, uh, typically uh, VMware ESXi will work. Um, we've also installed some Proxmox environments. And there's those public cloud options, uh, as I said, AWS and Azure. And some of the sort of high level benefits of the uh, the NG Firewall product itself are gonna be that hybrid cloud, uh, cloud managed on-premise gateway. So what that means is you've got our command center centralized management platform, it's available from anywhere right through web. And that can be used to both access and to manage your physical appliances, even if you're not in the room with them. As for the applications uh, and the UVM that I mentioned, we use virtual pipelining. So rather than serially chaining uh, individual applications, which can take a lot of time, traffic is inspected by all the apps all at once. And if any app should act upon that traffic, it does so kind of in its own, uh, its own time. We do have a fairly light hardware footprint. Um, it can be run on smaller, less expensive hardware. You can bring your own or you can purchase that from us. And also, uh, as I mentioned, those public cloud deployment options. I just want to jump in real quick. We had Please a do. great suggestion for those that were having technical issues um, to use your so cell phone to connect to the webcast um, as opposed to the desktop. So thank you for that suggestion. Absolutely. That's a great idea. And so if you do decide to purchase an appliance from us, these are kind of, these are your options, your hardware options at the moment. We've got in that left-hand column, the Z4 and the Z4 Plus, which are gonna be our small office, home office, uh, small to medium business appliances, and are also gonna be really useful for smaller branch offices that don't necessarily need a full, very powerful uh, firewall appliance. And then in the middle column, the mid-market or data center options, these are great for, um, medium-sized offices. The Z6 is usually rated for up to about 100 hosts simultaneously. The Z12 can usually run up to about 500 hosts. And then on the right-hand side, that corporate large campus, Z20 appliance. This is our flagship. It's our enterprise grade. Um, usually those are fine for anywhere between 500 and 3,000 hosts. So your very large sites, your headquarters, so on and so forth. And these are some of the parts that make up the NG Firewall whole. Uh, the kernel is based on Debian. It is currently Debian Buster. Um, we're looking to update that um, in a very in a very near uh, in the very near future to uh, Debian Bullseye, which is the next major version. Our intrusion prevention engine uh, is provided by Suricata and is powered by definitions by Emerging Threats, which are a company that that's what they do. That's their uh, that's their whole thing is creating definitions, creating and defining uh, certain kinds of behavior on the internet, things that can be categorized as intrusion attempts, as attacks, and so on and so forth. Application control gets its application signatures and its application definitions from a company called Sandvine. Web filter and threat prevention are both powered by uh, Webroot Bright Cloud. So this is going to be, uh, it's going to provide both Web Filters category information as well as the reputation database that is used by the threat prevention app. And we also provide anti malware in the form of Bitdefender. We call it Virus Blocker within the NG Firewall, but it is powered by, uh, by Bitdefender's antivirus. And our anti spam measures are going to be Mail Shell as well as Spam Assassin. Looks like there are a couple of questions, so I want to take those uh, kind of while we're here. Um, first question was, are all appliances rack mountable? And actually, it's going to be the Z6, Z12, and Z20 are specifically rack mountable. Uh, the Z4 appliances are little de little desktop units. Uh, if I can just back this up a little bit, you can see there on the left-hand side, these are, are actual physical images of these appliances. So the Z6, the Z12, and the Z20 are going to be your rack mount appliances, and they will come with rack mount kits. Uh, and then the Z4 and Z4 Plus are just little desktop kind of fanless applications. 
and we have a question uh, about exceeding license count. Uh, the Untangle subscription model uh, functions by hosts, by which we mean individual uh, individual IP addresses, unique IP addresses. So when you uh, when you exceed the number of licensed hosts, any devices, any of those hosts that are in excess of your count are automatically bypassed, meaning they are not subject to any filtering or processing. They still have access. Uh, we fail open in that case, so we don't block any traffic. We don't shut them down or anything. There's just no filtering or processing uh, that will go on for those particular devices. And in cases like that, um, we will discuss bypass rules a little bit more during our actual demonstration, uh, but you have the option to select certain devices that you don't need filtered uh, in case you want to you know, kind of keep track of license counts. couple of other questions. Uh, the Z4 Plus is going to be rated for usually up to 50 hosts. The difference between the Z4 and the Z4 Plus is the Z4 Plus has a significantly larger hard drive, which allows for better uh, or more significant retention of reports information. And it's going to have double the RAM. So it is uh, typically better in uh, in instances where you have a high application load, where you're trying to, to have kind of all the applications processing a fairly high amount of traffic. Someone has asked if uh, if they can have the slides after the presentation. I, I believe that we can make those available. Um, yes, the, the, they're, they will be on Bright Talk for you to download. Outstanding. Thank you, Sherilyn. Yep. Which of these integrated technologies are supported in Home Protect Basic and Home Protect Pro? All of them. Um, so the license that you pay for determines which paid applications you can use. It does not affect the version of the software itself. So the software is identical regardless of what subscription you're using. The subscription only determines which applications you're able to use. And those home those home packages, uh, Home Protect Basic and Home Protect Plus, um, Home Protect Plus is or uh, is typically going to have the the entire application load. The only thing that is missing from that is going to be live support, uh, which allows you to interact with our support team. Um, the Home Protect Basic has a, a slightly more limited application selection. Um, typically, doesn't include things like the higher end VPNs. Um, does not include our threat prevention application or um, some of the kind of integration features uh, like our directory connector application that lets you connect to Active Directory environments. Uh, is licensing based on hosts or devices? It is hosts. So every individual IP address is considered one host and one count against your license. And this is an interesting question. What was the reasoning behind using Webroot and Bitdefender both versus just using Bitdefender or Webroot since both selection, both solutions offer web filter threat prevention and anti-malware? I think uh, that this is a result of just kind of accruing things as the product has been in development. Uh, so NG Firewall has been, um, the product has existed, has existed in some form or another for approximately 15 years. And as we add features to it, um, each feature has kind of had its own sort of implementation. Uh, so Bitdefender is, uh, or the Virus Blocker app is kind of one of our older products. And I think that that was just something that we have had for a longer period of time. Um, we do occasionally change providers. So if some of you have been for us for a long time, you may remember that prior to version 14.2, we used a different provider for web filters categories feature um, and since switched over to Webroot instead of that previous company. So typically when we find that there is a benefit to the product and to you as the as the user, um, we, you know, we consider switching those things around. But uh, I think the short version is just those are the, those underlying technologies and engines are the things that made the most sense for what we wanted the, the specific feature to do at the time that we created it. And another question here, does this mean that hosts with short DHCP leases may be counted multiple times? No. Um, well, it, it can. It's going to depend on the, the duration of that lease. Obviously, things that are very short might be counted um, multiple times. Typically, a device is considered active until it stops passing traffic, and still it's, excuse me, until it stops passing traffic through the, the through the NG firewall. And then for typically 24 hours after that, the uh, the what we call entitled status 
uh, counts. So for something to kind of fall off of that uh, takes usually about 24 hours after it stops passing traffic. So it, it is possible um, if you have very short DHCP leases, you know, five minutes, 10 minutes, something like that, you may see that devices are, um, are being counted against your host counts multiply. All right, that looks to be all of the questions for the moment. So I'll just get back into this presentation. Another kind of cool feature that I like to uh, like to bring to everyone's attention, and this is not just a feature of NG Firewall, but it also it's also part of a command center as well. It's what we call Scout IQ, which is cloud-based threat intelligence service, aggregates anonymous telemetry data from across NG Firewall deployments worldwide. What that means is if any one NG Firewall unit anywhere out in the world sees a threat that is not currently covered by uh, certain definitions, whether it be virus block or whether it be intrusion prevention, things like that, we are going to report that threat and all of the relevant information back to a central database in command center and then push that threat information out to every other NG firewall in the world. So essentially, if one NG firewall has seen something, they all have seen something. So that's just an extra kind of feature that we build in uh, to help keep you and your network safe. And then kind of one of our last points is just to sort of show you the untangled security, excuse me, untangled network security framework as a whole. Um, our, our product offerings are going to be the NG firewall, which we're talking about today, command center, which is our cloud-based centralized management platform, and then our micro edge device, which is a super lightweight uh, network edge device, usually intended for very small offices, branch offices, things like that. And if you are interested in MicroEdge, we've got a ton of information on it. Um, you are more than welcome to reach out to our sales team, sales at untangled.com, and they'll be happy to provide you with all those details. And then that bottom image just sort of is uh, allows you to visualize kind of where, uh, where everything fits and how everything connects together in the network security framework provided by Untangled. I do want to touch on command center just a little bit, um, just because this is something that is going to be, um, it, it's pretty important for the management of your devices. Um, easily manage multi-site deployments, including zero touch provisioning. So we do uh, offer you the ability to assign a subscription to a device and to push a template configuration to that device before it's even online. So you can ship it to, you know, build it up for someone else, ship it to somewhere else. Um, and have that device ready to go. As soon as it connects to the internet, it will reach out to command center. It will grab uh, secure, uh, excuse me, subscription information as well as uh, those template configurations, if you've created any uh, application policies and everything, and essentially set itself up so that it's ready to go right out of the box. Command Center provides alerts, threat history, and auditing logs across your sites. So this gives you the ability to uh, to view sort of aggregate reports for your entire network as a whole. So Command Center is not necessarily going to provide you individual details about what's happening in each of your NG Firewall deployments, but you'll get to see what your network looks like with all of them, just kind of aggregate data over the, over the lot. You can manage your licensing. You can do software updates directly from Command Center without ever having to connect directly to the NG Firewall appliance. You can also do backups straight from the cloud without, again, without having to uh, connect to the individual NG Firewalls. You can create and sync policies across your fleet. So you may have a sort of master appliance that is set up the, exactly the way you want it, and then just push those policies either on demand or on an automated basis to other appliances. And Command Center also integrates with endpoint protection technologies from Malwarebytes, Bitdefender, and Webroot to provide you a little bit more information about uh, your downstream hosts and the individual devices within those networks. And I will pause a moment here for a question. Is license tied to MAC address or permits any number, any number of licensed devices? Uh, if I have 100 licenses, can I use 100 devices anytime? Uh, the license is, the subscription count is tied to host. So it's specifically going to be the IP addresses. It doesn't matter what the MAC address of the device is. Um, the, the NG firewall is looking for those individual IP addresses. So each, it, it's, I suppose, theoretically possible to have multiple IP addresses assigned to a particular MAC address. It's, I can't imagine a situation where you'd want that to happen. Um, but yeah, the, the MAC address is, is irrelevant. Um, that will come up in cases where, uh, for example, iOS devices, iPhones typically have um, 
somewhat variable MAC addresses. They do is sort of MAC address spoofing in a lot of cases. Um, and so those MAC addresses are not always the same um, from minute to minute, I'm given to understand. So again, what we're looking for is the IP addresses that are assigned to those particular devices. And then uh, if you have 10 devices, 10 IP addresses passing traffic through the, the NG firewall, that will count as 10 uh, slots against your license. Hopefully that makes sense. And so this brings us to kind of the meat of this demonstration. Um, a lot of what I have been going over prior to now is just sort of things that, sort of high level things about the NG firewall. Uh, of course, the important part of this is gonna be showing you what it looks like. So here we are. Uh, if you can, hopefully you can see my screen. This is gonna be the dashboard for NG firewall. This is the first thing that you see when you log into it and it's going to I'll give you kind of a high level overview of traffic passing through um, some details about this, the appliance itself. As you can see, there's this information widget that tells us a little bit more about uh, the, the appliance. There's the resource load. There's, these are physical resources um, being used by this appliance. And then some basic information about your network, um, including uh, currently active. So this, this number is important for the questions about licensing. So this is the number of active hosts that are currently passing traffic at the moment and therefore subject to license limitations. Maximum active is going to be the highest number of hosts we've ever seen. This is historical, uh, at least back to the last reboot of the appliance. And then known devices is going to count, is going to look at uh, specifically uh, MAC addresses, so specific devices that have connected and passed traffic through the untangle, as well as some information about your sessions. And then uh, some basic network layout stuff. So this is going to be your, you know, your interface is your external or your WAN interface, uh, as well as your internal interface and the amount of traffic passing through. And then some kind of high level data from some of our reports about interface usage and the top applications we're seeing. Uh, top host names are the hosts in the in, in the environment that are generating the most traffic. And this gives you, as I said, kind of like a high level um, at a glance overview for the. Um, for the, the network as a whole. And then uh, as we discussed, the NG firewall operates in two portions. So we're gonna dive first into the layer three stuff. And that lives here under config, top left of the screen there. And in sort of reverse order, um, about has some information about the device itself. So the most important thing is gonna be this UID, which is effectively a serial number for the software installation itself. And this will be important if you need to reach out to the support team. This will be the second thing they will ask you for uh, after your name and a contact email address. And it also provides some other information about uh, the device itself, such as the, the serial number associated with the hardware. If you purchase it from us, uh, this will have unpredictable results if you're using your own hardware, but typically it's not um, that important. And then the account that you're associated with, and then some details about the device itself. So we can see this one, for example, is running version 16.5, which is our current leading edge build. We can see the, the kernel information and then some just basic details about, about the appliance. And uh, if anyone, I, I do ten, tend to do sort of a high level overview in this because the NG firewall is a very big piece of software with a lot of moving parts. Um, if anyone has any, any questions about things that I've skipped over um, or you know tabs that I don't get into or things like that, please do feel free to ask them um, either in the question feature uh, here in Bright Talk or uh, you can leave contact information there as well and we can reach out to you afterwards. System is exactly what it sounds like. This is going to be details about uh, or functions for the appliance itself. So things like the time server. This takes a little bit of time because it does check time, uh, does check an NTP server uh, for accurate time when you come in here. Uh, but you can do time syncs, your time zones. Here in the support tab, we find these two options. Uh, this first one, connect to command center, is typically uh, I would say vital to the operation of the device. This is going to allow the NG firewall to connect to our central servers to share data um, where appropriate. We do not keep any, uh, there's no personal data shared. We don't send any information about your network um, you know, to command center or anything. It's, it's just gonna be things about the, the uh, appliance itself, typically when it's checking for updates, uh, whether it's looking for license status, things like that. And then the second option allows secure remote access to support team. If you need to use the support team, if you need to contact them for, for uh, 
technical support, you'll want to make sure that this option is enabled. That will allow the support team to actually connect directly to your NG Firewall appliance. They use the same GUI that you do, so it looks exactly the same, and they can actually uh, walk you through or directly make changes to your appliance. And we have the backup and restore options. So these do exactly what they say. Backup generates a backup file and will save it to the computer that you're currently connected to the NG Firewall through. Restore gives you the opportunity to uh, to restore any backups that you have. We have the upgrade option here, which governs upgrades to the Untangle software itself. Uh, an important distinction is that this is, again, the NG Firewall software itself. This does not have any impact on definition updates for any of the applications that get those inf that information from third parties. So Virus Blocker, if you disable automatic up upgrades, Virus Blocker will still get its definitions. Intrusion Prevention will still get definition updates, so on and so forth. It's just that the Untangle software itself, the NG Firewall, will not upgrade to any further versions without your specific say-so. And when an upgrade is available, you'll have a button here that says Upgrade Now. Local directory provides an active directory like environment where you can create a list of uh, essentially user IDs. This is going to be usable for authentication. Um, this is not for any users who are logging into the Untangle appliance itself. This is just for um, instances where you want to have essentially a list of user IDs and passwords that you want to be able to check against without using an external resource like a specific uh, active directory environment. And as you can see, we are also able to connect to an on premise radius server if you would like to use that for, uh, for authentication purposes. Email is important to touch on because this governs how we are sending email alerts from the NG firewall itself. So the default is gonna be our cloud hosted email relay server, which is essentially command center. So anytime this particular NG firewall sends an alert, it's going to send it to command center first and then command center will deliver that uh, to your specific email box. This is typically what we recommend for home users and for small environments, um, anything that doesn't have an on-premise email server is absolutely welcome to use this as, as well. Send email directly. We'll use the NG Firewall's own built-in email server to send email. So rather than going through command center, it just sends directly from the NG Firewall box. And then if you have a specified SMTP server you'd like to use, you can configure that here as well. Uh, if you're going to be using the spam blocker and fish blocker applications, we also have the safe list here where you can create a global safe list for email senders that are always allowed to, uh, to send email to your network. This is essentially a bypass list uh, for the spam blocker and fish blocker applications. So any email address that you enter here in the safe list under global safe list will not be scanned uh, when it comes through spam blocker and fish blocker. And you can also create these per user safe lists where uh, senders will be allowed to send email to certain um, recipients, but not to others. And if you're using the quarantine option, you'll have some, some options in here uh, for setting that up. How long do we hold those emails? Do we send a daily digest at what time? So on and so forth. Administration, This uh, there are a couple of places in here that will be important. Uh, so you can create and modify admin accounts for access to the Untangle itself. So for example, this is the default we see here. Um, the default username is gonna be admin, and then we have it associated with the email address that the account itself is under. We can enable or disable email alerts uh, to be sent to this, this user. So you might have another admin who doesn't necessarily need to get those alerts, but needs to be able to access the device themselves. So we could create new admin accounts here. And if you will be using uh, uh, IPSEC VPN with certificates, or if you'll be using the SSL inspector application, this certificates tab is important. Um, if you need to regenerate your NG Firewall server certificate for any particular reason, uh, there's a generate server certificate button down here at that bottom left-hand corner, which you can allow, which will allow you to do that. The most common case of that is going to be exactly what we see here. Um, there were some changes made to the interfaces in this Untangle after the software itself was stood up. So there are things that are missing from the certificate, which might cause some issues. And then the other thing I'd like to touch on here is this Google Drive connector. Um, this allows you to send reports data as well as cloud backups to a Google Drive account of your choice. And before we move on to the interfaces and the network setup, um, let me stop to answer a couple of questions. 
Are IPv6 and IPv4 both counted against licenses? For example, right now my PC has one IPv4 and six IPv6 addresses. How many licenses does that consume? One, because our applications are not able to process traffic based on IPv6. So IPv6 is essentially completely bypassed at this point. Um, we are able to route traffic back and forth, but none of the applications are able to process IPv6 uh, traffic. Uh, next question is interesting. Can we set two untangled units, one as a master and the second as a slave? Only one unit will be active at a time. Do we need to buy separate licenses for both units, or can we have the licenses floating between the active and passive unit? The subscription can only be assigned to a single UID at once, regardless of any kind of uh, what we call VRRP, or Virtual Redundant Router Protocol, which is essentially what's being described here. VRRP, there's not an option for a floating license. So you'll have two choices in that case. You can buy a single subscription for each appliance, or in the event of a failure, you can set up an alert so that you're, you're emailed um, or contacted as soon as the primary device fails and is replaced by the backup device. And in that case, log into your command center account and manually move the subscription over to the backup account. The third option is, of course, to simply operate in an unlicensed uh, fashion, so just without any application filtering. Um, on the uh, on the, the secondary device until you can kind of get the the primary back on its feet. Does spam blocking work with cloud hosted emails such as Office 365? Unfortunately, it does not. Uh, the spam blocker and fish blocker applications are only able to scan SMTP port 25 uh, emails. So if you have an if you do not have an on premise physical email server, those apps aren't doing anything for you. Will IPv6 be supported at a later time? It will. Uh, our engineering team are working on um, investigate, investigating that. Um, I, I work fairly closely with the engineering team, but I am not on the engineering team, so I'm not directly uh, involved with that kind of investigation. But it is obviously a, um, a prominent topic uh, in the world of internet security at the moment is IPv6 support, and uh, we are definitely, um, it is planned. I don't have really more specific information about when, whether we, when, you know, when we'll see it. Uh, backup to any targets other than Google Drive. Uh, not in a configurable fashion, no. Google Drive is the only offsite connector that we have directly. These backups, by default, uh, we have a con our configuration backup application, which we'll touch on in just a second, that is going to automatically create and send backups to your command center account. So you'll always have them there as well. Uh, connecting the Google Drive option allows you, you know, kind of a third party, another place where you can send those backups. Um, but at the moment, there is no integration for other um, cloud storage thing you know there's no uh, we can't send a dropbox or box or you know anything like that unfortunately yet i should say does the uid remain the same in virtualized environment replicating between hosts um it shouldn't the uid is unique to the software installation itself um it is i suppose theoretically possible for you to clone a virtualized um a virtualized install and then use that clone somewhere else you would run into some issues because uh, all of our central services, um, things like updates, our license server, et cetera, assume that a UID is unique. And so if we start to see it from multiple places, um, if things might start to behave somewhat uh, erratically. If the overall thrust of that question is, can I, use the same system image in multiple VRRP places so that it's always, um, you know, so that it's effectively high availability for the license. To be completely honest, I don't know. I don't, I don't know that we've ever tested that. Um, I guess in theory it would work, um, but that's not generally not a, um, I, I would say that's probably not a supported deployment um if you were to you know need to talk to our support team or even our engineers about it there might be some uh some difficulties with it uh gmail and g suite are not covered by spam filter so again that's only going to be if you have an on-premise email server um spam filter and or spam blocker and fish blocker cannot scan webmail is maybe a better way for me to put that
All right, so let me jump back into the demo here. Uh, here in interfaces, this is under config, network, and interfaces. These are all the physical interfaces that are associated with this, uh, with this NG firewall, as well as any logical interfaces. So if you've got any VLANs, you'll see those here. Each interface corresponds to a physical port. So for example, in this one, uh, this is a Z12, so it's got 12 physical ports. The first one is our external, which is gonna be our WAN, our internet connection. And then the second is our internal, which is the downstream LAN um, or internal network there. And the uh, one of the things that I like to touch on here is if you intend to use the Untangle as your DHCP server, you can configure that on a per interface basis. So each interface will have its own unique IP address as well as its own unique associated uh, IP address pool. And you can enable or disable DHCP serving on a particular interface at your option. So if we edit that internal interface, we see here we've got this DHCP configuration tab. And so this provides us with the DHCP pool that traffic using this particular interface will draw from. And then just kind of skimming some tabs here uh, in the network area. Hostname allows you to define the specific hostname of the device that you're that you're using. Um, these will, by default, these will be uh, the hostname will be Untangle, and the domain name will be example.com. We're going to recommend you change those. They don't necessarily need to be resolvable on the internet. Um, this doesn't necessarily have to be a public-facing hostname, but um, this will be the hostname that the device itself responds to within your network. If you use a dynamic, a dynamic DNS service provider, you can configure those options here. And then we've got these three options for the public address of the device. The most common is going to be use the IP address from the external interface. This just means that outside of your network, the Untangle is listening on and understands that its WAN IP address refers to it. So it will be listening on that. You also have the option to use the host name. If, for example, z12demo.example.com did resolve on the internet and I wanted to be able to reach this NG firewall remotely via the internet via that host name, then I can set this option, use host name. And then this last one, use manually specified address, is going to be if the untangle, uh, typically th the most common deployment for this is going to be this, this NG firewall is placed behind another router or firewall and it is going to accept uh, incoming VPN connections. So if we're trying to VPN to this NG firewall through an upstream router or another firewall, um, then we need to set up, we need to, to let the untangle know, you know, kind of where and when to listen. And then the next one, services. These are the ports on which the untangle itself serves its own uh, internal uh, its own internal services, so things like the web filter block page or uh, its its web GUI, for example, is reachable on the HTTPS port. So if you need or want to change those, those options are there. Port forwards are an important thing to discuss. This is how you allow traffic into your network. A port forward uh, essentially instructs the untangle when we see certain kinds of traffic arrive at this NG firewall from the, from the internet, from outside of our network, what do we do with it? So if you have an internal email server, an internal web server, something that needs to be accessible to the internet, then you would need to create port forward rules to allow traffic through to that device. NAT rules are effectively port forward rules, but the other direction. So these are going to be instances where you have internal traffic that originates inside of the network and heads out to the greater internet, and you want to control the IP address that those that, that traffic appears to come from. So it may be an instance where there's some sort of remote service that is expecting a particular uh, traffic to come from a particular IP address. That is where you would configure those NAT rules. Bypass rules, pretty important. Bypass rules give you the ability to exempt traffic from being passed to the UVM, the layer seven portion of the untangle. So it is handled entirely at layer three, not subject to any uh, application processing or filtering. So there are a couple of uses for this. One is going to be license counts. If you have devices in your network that you do not want to count against your licenses, you can create bypass rules for those devices here. I usually say anything with a, um, Anything that doesn't have a web browser is probably a good candidate for a bypass rule, but specific recommendations are going to be any VoIP traffic, as VoIP is very fragile and sometimes will not survive the transition to the UVM and back. 
as well as things like networked printers, especially if they need to be accessible from uh, multiple subnets. And bypass rules are also great for troubleshooting purposes. Um, if you are having difficulty with some device and you think the untangle might be doing something, you can create a bypass rule and effectively turn off all application filtering for that device. And that allows you to kind of rule out the untangle. Uh, if you bypass it and you still have the problem, then it wasn't the untangle in the first place. But if you bypass something and you don't, and that solves the problem, now you know that there's something uh, in the untangle's applications that's acting on that traffic. And filter rules are going to be your very basic. Um, these are these are firewall configuration rules. So these are going to be uh, they are layer three, so they have limited criteria. If you need to create uh, firewall type rules based on layer seven criteria, we'll talk about the firewall application in just a little bit. Um, but here there are some examples of things that you can do with filter rules. So this first one, allow open VPN clients to .123.25 only. So this would be cases where you've got uh, people connecting to your network from home via open VPN. VPN, and you want them to only be able to reach one specific internal resource, probably a file server, right? So this rule checks all incoming traffic for, uh, or all traffic, I should say, for these two conditions. It says, is the traffic, in a, is the traffic uh, coming from an open VPN interface? And is it destined to any IP address other than .123.25? And if so, we're going to block it. We're going to take this action. So that traffic obviously would still be allowed to this dot 25 address, but couldn't reach anything else. And then the second one is a pretty common use case. Um, we've got a guest Wi-Fi and we don't want anyone who's connected to the guest Wi-Fi to be able to access anything internally. So we can create a rule that says traffic originating from the guest Wi-Fi interface destined to any non WAN. So any interface that is not the internet connection, and we're going to block that traffic. So I am going to pause for just a moment here. We've got some questions piling up and I do want to address these. So give me just a second here. Lots of great questions today. Absolutely, yeah. Are port roles static, e.g. WAN and LANs? Are redundant WAN interfaces catered for? Um, this is an interesting question. I might need a little bit more detail about exactly what you're asking, but we do support multiple WANs. Um, our WAN balancer and WAN failover applications that we'll get to in just a little bit allow you some uh, some extra control over, over kind of how those WANs are used. Um, in an environment where the NG firewall has multiple WAN connections, the default behavior is going to be round robin. So it'll send a session through WAN A, a session through WAN B, a session through WAN C, and then back to WAN A, B, and C, and so on and so forth, um, essentially providing equal weight. And then we have the WAN balancer application, which allows you to specify more specific weights. So for example, if you've got a backup WAN, you can say 90% of traffic uses WAN A and 10% uses WAN B, as well as specifying that certain kinds of traffic always use a particular WAN. So you may have, again, a backup connection that's only used for some backup server in your environment that sends a great deal of traffic, but you only want that traffic to use this particular backup WAN. You can say all the traffic that comes from this backup server goes out through uh, the second pipe, as it were. Is it possible to schedule rules, uh, like more strict rules on the weekdays during business hours and less strict rules on your outside business hours? It is. This is a feature of our policy manager application and we will get into that in just a moment. Does NG Firewall support VLANs? It does, it absolutely does. Um, it is important to note that we do not tag any VLAN traffic, but we are able to route VLAN traffic. So I can actually just demonstrate uh, the creation of a VLAN interface here. A VLAN interface is just like a physical interface. The only real difference is that 802.11, uh, the 802.1Q tag, and that just needs to match whatever tag is being added by the switch that's actually doing the tagging downstream. But other than that, it's essentially identical. You just need to select the parent interface, which is the physical interface that that VLAN traffic is coming in on. Um, and you can also use it for, um, I've seen instances where we use VWANs as well. So you can use it for uh, external networks if uh, your ISP should require that. IP phones are not protected because they are bypassed or they consume a license and are protected. Um, the short answer to that is yes. Bypassing is going to be at your option. So you can either create bypass rules 
and thus those devices will not be uh, filtered through our applications and will also not count against your license. Or if you do want that traffic to be passed to the UVM and subject to our applications, our filtering and protection applications, um, they will be counted as hosts against your license. Is there an easy way to create filter rules? Currently, they are very hard to create and import. I wish I had a better answer for you on this one. Um, unfortunately, at the moment, they do need to be created individually. Um, we have a virtual suggestion box, which is located at feedback.untangle.com. And this is a fairly highly requested feature. Um, people are looking for ways to be able to create kind of batch import rules and things like that. Um, it is not a current feature, but it's something that we're working on. But to that end, it is possible. A filter rule doesn't necessarily have to be specific to like one particular IP address. So if you're using the conditions uh, with address in the name, so either destination address or source address, you can use an individual IP address or you can use multiple IP addresses separated by a comma so this rule, for example, applies to dot four and dot 45. That should have been dot five. You can also use a range of IP addresses separated by a dash. So one dot two dot three dot four. So this is a valid condition is uh, dot four through dot 10 inclusive. And you can also use a subnet insider notation on the two one six eight dot 10 dot zero slash 24. And so that is effectively dot ten dot asterisk, and uh, all of those rules are valid. So they can kind of cut down on some of the amount of work. But if you do need to create a you know a large number of individual rules, then unfortunately they do need to be created um, manually. But as I said, we are working on it. Uh, and someone asks, uh, yes, this video will be available on demand afterwards. Um, I believe Sherilyn can correct me if I'm not. Uh, if I'm mistaken, but I believe that you will you'll be emailed. I think once the um, once the webinar is complete, and it should have links to how to access it offline. Correct. Or how to access it uh, after the fact. I should say, not offline. Yes. Yeah. All the webinars are available on demand after, and where you also watch the webinar on demand, we will have the um, slide deck up there too, so you can um, take a look at the slides again. Absolutely. And and maybe a week after a webinar, um, we do put those on YouTube also. There you go. Plenty of options. Uh, someone asked, what is the limit to the number of unique IP addresses that can be included in one rule? This is a good question, and it's a very important question because the answer is 15. Now, what this means is that when you are creating um, a rule that uses IP addresses, this is going to be anywhere in the untangle, not necessarily just filter rules. You can, you can add up to 15 individual IP addresses to that rule. Um, any more and the rule will not work. So you can have as many rules as you need to. Um, but in a case like this, you would, uh, you would need to kind of break, you know, if you've got 30 uh, affected IP addresses, you'll need two rules with 15 per. And it is important to note here that what, when, I, when we say unique IP addresses, uh, ranges and subnets are not counted as their total value. They're counted as one entry. So... Um, to make that a little bit clearer, if I put in 192.168.10.1 through ten, Bear with me a moment. I haven't had my coffee this morning. Now, this rule uh, affects all IP addresses in that .10.1 through .10.10 range. But this rule sees two IP addresses. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, and then if you include a... Um, you include a subnet, so 10.11.1.1.0 slash 24. This is not 254 unique IP addresses. This is one for the purposes of this rule. So the subnet counts as one. The two individual IP addresses that we enter here as part of the range, those are those are individual. So that's two for the range as a whole. And then any individual addresses are counted individually. Clear as mud, I know. But hopefully that makes sense. And another question, just to confirm, bypass means there's layer three stateful filtering. Is that correct? Um, stateful is not necessarily uh, not necessarily a word that I would use that has a lot of meaning unto itself. Uh, I guess the, the question here is, what exactly you mean by stateful filtering? 
Um, the difference is that, uh, again, bypass traffic is handled entirely at layer three. Uh, it never touches the layer seven uh, portion of the untangle. So traffic, uh, when it when traffic arrives at the NGFW, um, it is it enters at layer three. If it is not bypassed, it is then passed to that Java virtual machine, the UVM, where the layer seven applications run. And then once all that processing and, and filtering is done, it is passed back down to layer three and then heads out to wherever it's going. Um, if you create a bypass rule, that UVM layer seven function is never invoked. So the traffic in enters at layer three, is handled entirely at layer three, and then leaves at layer three. And so for the purposes of that question, the, the filtering aspects are gonna be these filter rules, um, as well as any kind of routing that you might have set up. Hopefully that addresses your question, but if not, um, as I said, we have, we have our, uh, you can leave your contact information and we'll follow up. And uh, someone asks, is there a limit to the number of rules that can be created and run? There is not, um, but we're gonna advise a certain amount of caution. Obviously the more rules there are, the bigger resource load you're gonna have. And so we are at about 10 minutes to the hour. And so unfortunately, I'm going to have to um, I'm going to have to belay any other questions that we have coming up just so that I can kind of go over the other portion, the application settings uh, pretty quickly. And then, as I said, if you do have any specific questions, anything that wasn't um, addressed, please do reach out to us and we'll be happy to um, we'll be happy to kind of address those things and help out. Um, so overview of Untangle applications. Most of these do exactly what they sound like. So for example, web filter, this is our URL filter. This is going to look for HTTP and HTTPS traffic on ports 80 and 443 and do stuff to it. Um, we have the options to block individual sites, to pass individual sites, uh, to pass entire clients. So if you've got a device in your network that never needs web filtering uh, or you want never to be subject to web filtering, you can create this pass client here. And then one of the other cool features is going to be this categories option. So this is what we were talking about earlier with the bright cloud web roots uh, stuff. They have made an effort to categorize the entire World Wide Web uh, into specific categories. And uh, I've lost track of the number. Um, it is something on the order of seven to eight billion uh, individual websites have been categorized according to uh, to WebFilter or uh, to WebRoot, I should say. And uh, each of these is kind of a themed grouping. So as you can see, streaming media, shareware, content delivery networks, et cetera. And we give you the option to block a whole category, essentially a whole flavor of websites with one click. By default, we are going to block uh, these six security-related uh, concerns. So these are going to be basically bad stuff, malware for the most part. And we also enable an adult and pornography block. And then this questionable category, which is basically things that interfere with the way the browser itself works um, and typically don't require a lot of, um, there, there isn't a lot of legitimate use for that kind of thing in most networks. So then moving on to our other applications, as I said, Virus Blocker uses Bitdefender. Um, this is updated every four to six hours or so. So it's effectively real time um, and provides you with sort of an extra layer of, you know, virus protection and malware protection at the gateway. Spam Blocker and Fish Blocker do exactly what they sound like. But as we said, those are limited to uh, on-premise email servers. So it's only going to be useful uh, in those cases. They don't read webmail. Bandwidth control allows you to prioritize or to deprioritize certain kinds of traffic as you need. SSL inspector improves the functioning of some applications uh, like web filter and virus blocker by decrypting HTTPS encrypted packet headers. There's a little bit of extra setup involved with that. So we typically tell people unless you absolutely need to, like you have a legal requirement to do it, usually SSL inspector is not going to be recommended. Um, Application control functions similarly to web filter, but instead of looking at specifically web traffic, it's looking at certain kinds of behaviors as well as application signatures. And so, as I said, these are provided by a company called Sandvine. We currently have about 2000 signatures and you know, there's, there's a signature for almost anything. There's a YouTube application uh, signature. There is, there's one for TikTok, whatever, uh, you know, whatever you might need should be in there and gives you the ability to block those applications. Um, in a way that extends beyond simple web traffic. Captive Portal, if you've ever used public Wi-Fi, you know what this is. This pops a page that says you must agree to our terms and conditions, or you must sign into something in order to access our, um, access our internet. The firewall application is similar to the filter rules we discussed back at layer three, but it has some additional criteria uh, because it operates at layer seven. And one of the most important ones that I like to cover are gonna be these client country and server country options. So this gives you the ability to say, if traffic comes from a certain country, for example, maybe I wanna block traffic from Russia, I can create a rule that does that. And we can do it the other way as well. Uh, we don't allow any traffic out to, for example, 
Russia, wherever it might be. Threat prevention is an IP reputation database lookup. So this consults an external database also run by WebRoot. And uh, you, the default setting is going to be high risk. So anytime we do a lookup that comes back at high risk, we're going to block that. Anything else with any of the other kind of rating categories will be allowed through. And you can adjust the sensitivity of this as necessary, as well as uh, creating specific rules to, to include or exclude traffic from threat prevention filtering. And then getting down to the bottom section, I'm going to do these in reverse order. So it's going to be the live support application. If you have the live support subscription, this allows you to actually create a ticket directly from the uh, the NG firewall itself and send it straight to the support team. Um, and that'll save you a little bit of time just because it's going to include the UID automatically without you having to hunt that down. Branding manager allows you to change the uh, the the logo that you're seeing. So in the top left-hand corner, we've got this default Untangle logo here. You can change that to whatever you would like. And it also allows you to change some of the kind of default text in some of the pop-up pages like the Captive Portal or uh, WebFilters block page. Configuration Backup generates an automatic uh, backup at a time of your... Oh, it's not enabled. That's embarrassing. Uh, at a time of your choosing, you can also force an immediate backup at the time. And again, we discussed that you can send those backups to Google uh, as well as to Command Center. Intrusion prevention uh, is only useful if the NG firewall is the edge of your network. So if there's another router or firewall upstream of us, you don't need this. Um, or rather, it doesn't do anything. It is looking for specific kinds of behavior, um, attack patterns, uh, intrusion attempts, that sort of thing, and it will block all of that sort of thing, providing an extra kind of behavior-based layer of defense at the edge of your network. The VPN options do exactly what they say on the TIN. Um, IPsec VPN also includes uh, L2TP, which is the built-in uh, VPN that you know usually think about with Windows clients, uh, as well as Ike uh, tunnels. And then we also support WireGuard VPN and Open VPN, both in client and uh, server mode, and to allow uh, remote client connections, as well as site-to-site -site connections. Tunnel VPN is going to be a very specific implementation, and typically this is what's going to be used to allow the NG Firewall to act as a client to an anonymizing VPN service, something like a NordVPN or a private internet access, uh, allows the NG Firewall to act as the client rather than individual devices. WAN Balancer, as we discussed earlier, allows you to control the weight of your specific WANs. Obviously, this, this particular device only has the one. If I had more than one, I could set specific weights and say, you know, for example, WAN A gets 80% of traffic, WAN B gets 20%. WAN failover is going to initiate uh, a test. Typically, it's going to be a ping test to something outside on the internet that has 100% uptime. And when we see a certain number of failures of those tests, we will mark the WAN itself that we're testing as down. So this provides sort of a sanity check to make sure that the WAN itself is uh, is up and functioning. And that works kind of hand in hand with WAN balancer in instances where you've got, for example, a primary WAN that you want used all the time unless it's down, and then a backup WAN that should only be used if the primary goes down. Directory connector allows you to connect to an active directory environment. So this is of, uh, of limited use for a lot of people, but in anyone in any case where you've got you know kind of a corporate environment or someplace that just uses Active Directory, we can connect to that Active Directory server and get username information uh, and logon information, so that the Untangle can then use uh, Active Directory criteria again, such as usernames, group membership, etc., to enact uh, policies. Policy Manager is. Um, one of our most powerful applications, and it allows you to create subsets of applications. So you can have essentially a group of users who's subject to one set of applications, another group of users who has different applications uh, or has different levels of access through the NG firewall. The best example that we, we usually provide is going to be, um, you might block Facebook in your entire organization, but you've got a marketing team who needs access to Facebook. So you create one policy that governs everyone, and then another policy that governs the marketing folks, and the marketing folks have their own set of access that is not dependent upon the basic default policy of the network. And finally, the reports app governs uh, the most important thing here is going to be this data retention. It's going to tell you, uh, that's going to instruct the NG firewall uh, how long it can hold on to reports data. All right, Sherilyn, I think we did it. I think we are just in under the time there. Uh, I, I, I appreciate everyone uh, giving me the, you know, bearing with me on this one, uh, giving me the opportunity to show off our product. Obviously, I think it's pretty cool. Um, and I like all the things that it does. Um, I will turn you back over to Sherilyn now for closing remarks and everything. And uh, have a great one. All right, everybody. Um, just real quick, 
You can contact support at support at untangle.com. Um, all our contact information is on the website. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, hope you learned a lot about NG Firewall and have a great rest of your day.